Welcome to the Game Dev Pantry, a series where we retro-engineer interesting mechanics in Unreal Engine 4. Before we jump in though, we invite you to stay around until the end of the video for some exciting news. Today is part 2 of a longer project where we tackle retro-engineering Hollow Knight's character. We briefly mentioned in the previous part how one of the reasons the knight feels so smooth to control is because of the incredible animation work that Team Cherry has put in the game. Well, today we'll showcase the positive effect that it can have. This will also allow us to add in the attack animations. There won't be much in-depth talking about game design for this episode as it is more focused on the interesting adventure that is working with the Hollow Knight sprites in Unreal. Do not try this at home. We'll use the animations found in the base game of Hollow Knight. After all, they're the most suited to showcase the character controller. Let's give a few examples on how the Hollow Knight animations perfectly complement the character controller. If we take a look at the jump, we notice that it is only composed of three frames. That is because like most movements in Hollow Knight, the jump is instant and doesn't have anticipation. To make this feel more natural, the animation in the jump showcases the knight reacting to this instant acceleration. We can see his head tilting downwards and his cape being slightly jerked in response to the movement. Most of the animations have very subtle movements with only one or two distinctive features. This keeps the visual information clear, concise, and it fits with the overall aesthetic of the game. So we'll take a sprite sheet inspired from the game, and implement it in our prototype. However, using Hollow Knight sprite sheets will prove... Uh, challenging. Can you spot the jump animation? Well, if you guessed there, you're wrong. It's actually here, here, and here. So first we're gonna have to cut them into the appropriate size. Except that's not just it, some of them are rotated, some aren't even facing in the right direction, and... Whew! Lucky for us, a lot of the work can be avoided, because there already is a sprite sheet with the labeled frames of animation. With this sprite sheet, we can use Unreal's cutter to automatically cut it for us into neat little sprites that we can later combine into animations. Except we still need to find the sprites we need for each of them. And once we've identified each of the necessary sprites, We'll change the base texture from a cookie cutter image to the actual sprite sheet. To avoid doing it one by one, we can select all our sprites and select the bulk edit via property matrix. This allows us to make changes that affects our whole selection. So we'll do that. We only need a few sprites for the current character controller, so we'll focus on those. And now we run into the second problem. Some of our sprites are rotated, and some of them are facing in the wrong direction. To solve this problem, we're going to need to be a little bit clever, because Unreal doesn't offer the most practical tools when dealing with 2D assets. To be fair, I don't think people designing tools foresaw the use of a sprite sheet that looks like this. The first thing we're going to do is make our own sprite master material. Since some of the sprites include transparency, we'll set the blend mode to translucent. A sprite material is composed of two base things, a source texture and a vertex color. Simply multiply the source texture and the vertex color and plug them into their respective inputs. The problem we're trying to solve is rotated and flipped sprites, so we need parameters that allow us to rotate and flip the base texture. The first one we'll make is a float parameter to rotate the texture. We'll use the custom rotator function and plug the results in the UV of the source texture. For the flip, we only want it to flip across vertically. To do this, we simply need to take the R component of our rotated UV and do a 1-X. This will flip the UVs as we can see. We'll make a boolean parameter to be able to switch between the two, flipped and non-flipped. Now that our master material is done, we'll create instances for each situation we require namely 90 degrees rotation and a flip. Once that's done, we can begin adjusting the sprites that we need to. We replace the default material by the necessary instance. This brings another complication though. 
You see, the material rotates or flips the entire base texture, but not the coordinates. To remedy this, we'll adjust the coordinates of the source UVs in the sprites that need adjustment. Here's the math needed to adjust for each type of texture. Now all that's left is to create a paper flipbook for each animation. Amazing! It looks so smooth! The problem with paper flipbooks is that they only use one material for the whole flipbook instead of taking the default one for each individual sprite. To remedy this, we'll have to turn the flipbook into a blueprint so that we can adjust the material every frame. To help us use this flipbook in different places, we'll set up an editable variable that contains the source flipbook we want to use. We'll have it set itself as the flipbook of our blueprint on the construction script. The blueprint will check every frame, what is the default material used by the sprite, and then set the flipbook material as that. Let's turn that into a function and add it to the construction script. That way we can see the animation without having to press play. This seems to work. During play, however, you'll notice that there is always a delay of one frame for the update. This is because the flipbook seems to update after our tick fires. To remedy this, we need to go into class defaults and change the tick group from pre-physics to post-physics. This sadly doesn't work perfectly for the construction script, so we'll have to live with that. Finally, we have animations that work. Let's add those to the character. We'll open back our Night Blueprint and add a Child Actor component. We'll set its Actor class to our Flipbook Blueprint. Since we created a variable that allows us to set the Source Flipbook, we can set the base animation ourselves. We chose the Fall animation because it has always the same material and therefore doesn't glitch with the construction script. We use this to adjust the size of the sprite animation to fit the base capsule. Once that's done, we need to change the flipbook based on what the knight is currently doing. To do that, we'll create a master function called setAnimation. Then, we'll simply use a select node that chooses a flipbook based on the movement mode. We'll use this select to fire the setFlipbook function. That is the first part. The next part is to change the direction that the knight is looking based on the input. For this we'll have to check what direction the player is holding and perform two things. Set rotation of the flipbook actor, based on if it's left or right, and set a vector parameter that gives us the direction that the character is looking at. This last variable will prove useful during later stages of the prototype. We'll call this whole function look. Now we just need to add the set animation function to our event tick chain. Once that's done, we can press play to check how it looks in the game. As you can see, simply adding the animations help the feel of the character tremendously. With that done, we can move on to adding the ability to attack. On to the attack. A lot of what makes the combat in Hollow Knight feel so good is how the attack works. Like everything in the game, it is extremely responsive, but it also has a few other pluses. The range is slightly bigger than the animation, especially when attacking downward or upward, to reduce frustration from misgaging the distances. A successful kill on an enemy generates a few frames of hit lag. But most importantly, each successful hit creates a bit of knockback without stopping the player from controlling the character. All of this contributes to a fast-paced, precise, but still crunchy combat. For that, we'll need to add three of the flipbooks and attach them to our main flipbook. Two of those can be regular flipbooks, while the last one has to be our blueprint flipbook. What these flipbooks will be is the animation for the effect of the slash. Let's add each slash to the animation. The forward slash and the down slash can be set to the regular flipbooks, but we need to make sure that the paper flipbook has the correct material. The up slash, however, 
has two different materials, so we use our flipbook blueprint for this one. We'll also add a trigger box for each flipbook and adjust it to match the size of the animation. We'll make them slightly bigger, especially for the up and down slash, as those moves are often performed in movement, and thus we want a more generous hitbox for those. At some point it'll be necessary to access the flipbook blueprint of our child actors. Since they're child actors, we'll need to set variables of them as blueprints and cast them to those variables. Since this will allow us to access the functionality of the flipbook itself, We'll set those at begin play. Also at begin play, we'll set the slash effects to not visible, not looping, and not playing. When we're not attacking, we don't need them. For the attack animation, we'll make a custom event called attacking. This event will be called by the press of the attack button. First, to make sure it can't be called while the player is currently attacking, we'll create a boolean that checks if the player is currently attacking. If he is, we won't trigger the attack event. The event will perform many things. First, it will set the boolean we just created. We also want to check what is the attack direction. And for that, we'll make an other enum with all four directions as their label. Then, we'll create a variable using this enum and set it during the attack using this bit of code. In Hollow Knight, the game prioritizes up and down attacks. This means that, when using a keyboard, you can press down and forward while jumping to perform downward attacks while moving. This is especially useful in harder parts of the game. We're going to create a paper flipbook variable for the animation of the knight when he swings. Each time the knight attacks, we'll set what this animation will be based on the direction of the attack. The next thing that should happen is to set our character's animation to the animation of him performing a slash. We won't be adding this to the attacking event. Instead, we'll head to our setAnim function and create a new select that overrides our selection of animations if the character is attacking. After that, we'll set the appropriate slash to start playing and become visible. Now let's add functionality. For this, we're going to need a blueprint interface. As we discussed in the Doom video, interfaces can allow us to call a blanket function onto anything. Depending on what we call the function on, it will perform different behaviors or nothing at all. We'll call this function nail attack. The function will have one output to see if the attack knocks the player back. We'll call it knockback. This is because not everything in Hollow Knight causes knockback on hit. Once that's done, we'll return to our knight and create the attack scan function. Once again, based on the direction of the attack, we'll choose which hitbox to use for scanning. We'll set that hitbox as a local variable, and then check each actor that overlaps with it and fire the nail attack interface. If any of them returns a knockback, we'll check a local boolean to that effect. Once the loop is completed, we'll fire a new function called startKnockback if the knockback boolean has been checked. For the knockback, we want something not too hard but still noticeable. We'll use a similar configuration of functions as the one we used for the jump. Start knockback, knockback, and stop knockback. The start knockback will set the knockback boolean to positive and set the knockback direction. The knockback will check for the boolean and then add velocity based on the direction of the knockback, and will also make a timer to make it stop after the chosen duration has expired. The stop knockback will simply reset the timer and set the boolean to false.
We need not forget to add the knockback to our series of event tick. The final touch is to make sure that the slashes return to invisible once they're finished playing. Now with this, we can create an object that can receive the attack interface call. In Hollow Knight, most walls will knock you back when you attack them. So, we'll set the walls to simply return knockback when hit. This gives us very similar behavior to that of Hollow Knight. We can also see that the movement feels a lot more fluid with the animations implemented. Of course, our Great Knight is missing a few power-ups. We'll tend to that in the next episode. In the meantime, let's enjoy the progress we've made with a little platforming. So before we roll the credits, we wanted to share some exciting news with you. Since we've had an amazing response from you all, we decided to launch our own Patreon. If you want to support us, it is the best way to do so, and you'll gain access to our Discord, game dev resources, sneak peeks, and even the project in advance. Anyway, thanks for joining us for this episode of the Game Dev Pantry. If you liked the video, please consider sharing and giving us a thumbs up. We're welcome to any feedback in the comments below, and don't forget that you can grab the project following the link in the description. See you in the next one.